I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today for um, what is really a, a treat for us. Uh, we have a fantastic guest. Uh, before I introduce our guest um, speaker, I, I just want to uh, say a few brief words about our centre at Johns Hopkins University, the International Vaccine Access Centre. Um, our uh, raison d'etre, with the reason that we exist, is that we really aim to generate and use uh, the best available evidence to provide policy support for countries and advocacy work to enable access to vaccines for all persons everywhere, um, both children and adults, uh, as best we can, so that we can really have an equitable opportunity for a thriving and, and healthy life for, for everybody. Uh, we do that through a number of different uh, mechanisms. Uh, we provide country support around vaccine uh, planning uh, and implementation. We track vaccine, uh, 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 both vaccine coverage and disease epidemiology and the interaction of those. Um, we have a very strong uh, body of work around economics and finance of vaccines. Uh, and we uh, look at the gaps in vaccine coverage and the way in which um, uh, equity can be addressed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have a, a very broad range of uh, vaccines that we work with and antigens that we address, uh, but of recent uh, uh, months and years really now, approaching the second year now, a lot of our focus has been around uh, response to the COVID pandemic. Um, we provide resources for health workers uh, in addressing uh, uh, our understanding uh, vaccine uh, development and vaccine safety and vaccine sciences more broadly. We provide virtual trainings and webinars for uh, COVID vaccine work, particularly with a focus on work in India. Um, we provided direct response and relief activities and efforts in India itself. Um, we have uh, mechanisms for tracking uh, vaccine deployment around the world, uh, coverage and the, uh, the different um, vaccine effectiveness estimates that are uh, being conducted around the world, uh, including against variants of concern. We have a strong body of work around social media research and addressing a vaccine confidence, supporting vaccine confidence, and looking at economic analyses of routine immunization services, including their disruptions. So some of our, our, our work is shown on the screen. Next slide, please. Uh, these are two tools that are, uh, three tools, in fact, that uh, you'd be very welcome to uh, just uh, look at uh, look at yourself after this. Uh, one is the uh, um, COVID-19 vaccine resource hub, a resource library, uh, which is um, information for healthcare workers uh, to be able to uh, address their own questions around uh, the vaccine. Um, we have also training initiatives that are there with slide decks and, and information that's available for use. And we have both for the general public and for health workers a vaccine chatbot, which is a fun way of interacting and asking directly uh, questions around uh, COVID-19 vaccines and having uh, evidence-based information immediately made available uh, uh, in an interactive way. Uh, it's designed for, for youth and for young adults. We also have uh, work locally, uh, even though our view is very much global, we've looked stateside as well, as, and particularly in the Baltimore community. And um, it was hard hit in, in the US, we've been very hard hit by COVID. And we have projects in Baltimore to address uh, vaccine access and acceptance uh, and supporting uh, vaccination in older adults as well and working closely with health departments. Next slide. Um, so I'd just like to um, really welcome uh, Professor Peter Hotez, uh, who's a, a star guest speaker today. Uh, Professor Hotez is the Dean of the National uh, School of Tropical Medicine at the Baylor College of Medicine in Texas. And he's also the director at the Center for Vaccine Development there at the Texas Children's Hospital. Um, Professor Hotez hardly needs any introduction. He's globally recognized uh, for his contribution both to clinical pediatric infectious diseases and to tropical pediatrics. Uh, he's, his work uh, across the range of vaccine sciences and vaccine development. And he's really been a hugely influential vaccine advocate. And we're super thrilled that we um, are able to welcome you, uh, Professor Hotez. And I'd very happily hand over the, uh, the microphone to you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. It was a very kind introduction. And uh, it's an honor for me to be back, even though it's uh, virtually. Uh, I was in Washington, D.C. for 11 years from 2000 to 2011. And I would usually visit Hopkins uh, two, three or four times a year and and often to IVAC and, and meet with everybody. And IVAC's always been an extraordinary uh, source of uh, uh, wealth of information. 
and also inspiration. Um, I, you know, I'm just incredibly impressed with the work that's been going on with IVAC uh, for a very long time. And so I feel really honored to be able to uh, speak with you today. I'm going to try to share my slides and talk for about 30, 35 minutes or so. And, uh, and then we can have a hopefully a, a robust um, a Q and A. So thank you for this uh, opportunity uh, to be here. Uh, before I start, I just wanted to give a, a little shout out to two um, revered colleagues. Um, you know, uh, when the, at the time when I was chair of microbiology at George Washington, I was also president of the Sabin Vaccine Institute, and I often say the two of the best things I did when I was president of the Sabin Vaccine Institute was recognize Dr. Santosham and Kate O'Brien, who of course was linked uh, to uh, IVAC. And again, two individuals who are incredible sources of inspiration. And uh, I always look forward to staying in touch with, with both of them. Actually, when, when, when Dr. O'Brien got the Young Investigator Award, it was the first and only time we had ever awarded the Young Investigator Award. So um, I think that was truly one of my stunning accomplishments was creating the award, giving it to her. And then I guess we couldn't find anybody ever as, as, as remarkable. They should bring back the award, I think, but maybe they will one day. But again, just um, you, I can't tell you enough how much I think of the, the, the scientists and staff and professors at IVAC as all, all, all vaccine heroes and deeply appreciative of, of all your extraordinary work. Now, I've been in Texas for 10 years, um, almost 11 now. Um, we started this product development partnership that initially was through SABE, and now it's through the Texas Children's Hospital. It's called the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development, and it's co-directed by myself and my science partner for the last 20 years, Mary Elena Patazzi, who I'm sure many of you know, and mo mostly focused on vaccines for parasitic diseases. And in the past, when I've spoken at IVAC, I've spoken about you know, some very difficult targets, making vaccines for parasitic worms, as well as complex protozoa, like Trypanosoma cruzi, the cause of Chagas disease and Leishmaniasis. And that's still a great passion, but about when, one of the first things we did when we moved to Texas, you always like to try new things when you make a move. And uh, in this case, we um, started working with the New York Blood Center. And uh, what happened was Sarah Lustigman, who was working on a river blindness vaccine with us, introduced us to two, vac two coronavirus scientists, Shi Bu Jiang and Lan Ying Du, who are working on a SARS vaccine. And we worked with them to adopt it and began uh, developing technologies to identify the spike protein as the target of, the, of, the, of coronavirus vaccines, how you deliver the spike protein, how you induce virus neutralizing antibodies and rev up virus neutralizing antibodies to increase protection. And, and I tell that story because not many, when people think of COVID-19 vaccines, one of the anti-vaccine talking points is they appeared out of nowhere. And, and I say, no, it really, you know, was began a decade before with work from our group and others doing all of that legwork showing how you deliver the spike protein and the safety of delivering the spike protein. And, and then we, um, when the when the SARS sequence, uh, SARS two sequence came out in January, we pivoted around and made a COVID vaccine, and I'll and I'll talk about that as well. But before I do that, I'd just like to give an overview and talk about the new book, which by the way was is published by Johns Hopkins University uh, Press, and that's another uh, strong tie that I have to Johns Hopkins, and. And in the book, I talk about the great successes of the Gavi Alliance, which um, the, the group at J IVAC knows better than anybody. I, I always say this is one of the most extraordinary programs uh, uh, ever and ever launched. You know, it was, began with $750 million of support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to create this alliance with pharm the pharma companies the academic sector, WHO and UNICEF and, and World Bank, and and you know it, you it's now headed by Seth Berkeley, and you just can't help but marvel at the incredible success of bringing down measles deaths by eighty seven percent and pertussis and tetanus and diphtheria and meningitis, and you know the work at IVAC has been so critical to the support of and, and a lot of the 
thought content behind all of this. And, you know, it's just one of the most important public health stories that still has not been fully told. Uh, those photographs on the right, um, when I worked closely with Ciro de Quadros, who of course has also done a lot of work with IVAC when I was at the Sabin Vaccine Institute, he helped organize a, a, um, a showing of these photos at Pan American Health Organization by Sebastio Salgado, a great Brazilian photographer who went all around the world photographing kids getting their vaccinations, especially polio vaccinations. And you can download most of them now um, by an internet search. And they're just an incredibly moving set of photographs because of the expression on the faces of the parents, especially for everything from hope to joy to fear. And, and, and I think um, and I think that's going to be especially relevant as we move forward towards COVID vaccinations. And, and the book, the new book that I've written, published by Johns Hopkins University Press, is, uh, is called Preventing the Next Pandemic Vaccine Diplomacy in a Time of Anti-Science. And most of it was actually written prior to the emergence of COVID-19. It was mostly written by the end of 2019. And and it basically said, you know, yes, we've made extraordinary gains in our ability to vaccinate the world's children, but we've started to see some partial unraveling in different areas of the world. And they're happening because of things that, that we, as phys physician scientists or vaccine scientists, we don't ordinarily get training to think about things like poverty and war and political instability or collapse or urbanization or deforestation or climate change and and this aggressive rise in anti-science and those individuals on the left there at the top is Robin Coleman has been my incredible editor at Johns Hopkins University Press and Catherine Margie who helps with um, helps with book promotion and Nathaniel Wolf somebody I brought with me from Washington to Texas who helps me a lot with editorial matters and I can't tell you how um, exciting it's been to work with Johns Hopkins University Press that's really helped turned me into a writer. So about 10 years ago, I've always wanted to be a writer. I love books and bookstores and just started doing it in Johns Hopkins University. This is my fourth book now and Johns Hopkins University has been just an incredible ally uh, to help me through this process. So I'm not a great writer yet, I'm still, a, but I'm an okay writer now. And and it's very meaningful for me to write, write these books. So a main part of the book was to say, even before COVID-19, we were starting to see some unraveling of of all of our successes through the Gavi Alliance and others. And so let me give you some examples uh, the Arabian Peninsula, for instance, because of the uh, and when I served as US science envoy in, in the State Department, um, they sent me there at a very difficult time 2015 2016 at the height of the ISIS occupation, and the Syrian conflict and the proxy wars between Iran and Saudi Arabia were starting in Yemen, and this was collapsing health systems, particularly for vaccinations. And we started to see a lot of breakthrough measles and, and even polio. And then um, vector control program stopped. So we saw this rise in cutaneous leishmaniasis, which the locals call Aleppo evil. And Aleppo itself had become uh, packed with people because of 50 degrees Celsius temperatures were drying up ancient agricultural lands along the Tigris and Euphrates. And this in itself was causing instability. And some even cite all of the conflicts on the Arabian Peninsula due to water drought, water shortages, drought, and these unprecedented high temperatures. Or another example is uh, what uh, Jeffrey Gettleman for the New York Times called Africa's unwars, meaning they're not wars between, conventional wars between armies, but armed banditry upon citizen populations like we're seeing in Northern Nigeria and the Boko Haram areas, again, bringing back vaccine preventable diseases and neglected tropical diseases like sleeping sickness and, and others. Or in Central Latin America with the collapse of the Maduro regime, causing that socioeconomic decline in, in Venezuela, again, halting of, of vaccine programs, the return of measles, and then as uh, people were fleeing the country into the, into the Amazon in Brazil, bringing measles with them, coming in contact with ancient indigenous people like the Yanomami or, and causing devastating measles outbreaks there or across the border in Colombia with the Wayu indigenous people, same thing. And then um, no employment, you working in the illegal gold mining industry, sleeping outdoors, 
attacked by malaria infested mosquitoes, a 400% rise in malaria, all of this, and then a 40 year drought on top of that. So now you're starting to see some dialogue about cl the role of climate change uh, in bringing back disease. But one of the things that I found for this book is it's not just climate change uh, alone, it's climate change working together with these social determinants. And I have Texas and the Gulf Coast there, not so much for war and political collapse. So who knows, maybe that'll happen too, I, I hope not. But we are seeing aggressive urbanization and this rise in anti-science, which is bringing back disease. And so the point is when, when COVID hit, you know, some people think of COVID-19 as this extraordinary event, how could it have happened? And my argument is, well, it's not so much an extraordinary event, it's the, a culminating event of declines that we were starting to see. There was, a, with, despite all the excellent things happening with the Gavi Alliance, there had been a fraying. And so far, COVID-19 seems to be affecting mostly what's also kind of interesting, the G20 countries, the, the largest economies, but it tends to be those living in low-income neighborhoods in the G20 economies like Brazil and the United States or South Africa or, or India. And that is not too surprising for me because this the one of the first books I wrote for Johns Hopkins University Press was called Blue Marble Health. And it's a concept that is not widely accepted yet for full disclosure. It basically says when you look at the world's poverty related diseases and when we think of global health issues, we always think always couch it in, or frame it in terms of wealthy countries versus poor countries. And one of the findings in the Blue Marble Health book, and this is a new update from Johns Hopkins University Project Muse that we did, is that the when you if the real high numbers of neglected tropical diseases as well as tuberculosis and dengue and leprosy and the list goes on are actually the poor living among the wealthy, the poor amidst wealth. And and I tell that because from a policy perspective, it has a lot of implications in terms of greater ownership of these problems from, from the G20 countries. And I think that's clearly um, turning out to be the case for, for COVID-19. Now, of course, we're all consumed now with this horrible Delta variant and dealing with the uh, mutations and the, the furin cleavage site that seemed to be help, helping like at the 681 position that seemed to be promoting greater transmission as well as some possible vaccine escape at the 452 position and the receptor uh, 4, 417 position uh, for, for the receptor binding domain. And this is creating a, a, a lot of uh, issues, of course, now in, in the United States and, and the communication has been a bit off and unfortunately it's been coming out in odd ways like the last night, um, the leaked um, internal communication from Centers for Disease Control that was put out in the Washington Post. So a number of us are trying to you know, help work with CDC to, to do some damage control about the, the communication side. The good news is the vaccines seem to be still pretty robust in terms of symptomatic illness. Um, uh, this is actually taken from the Financial Times, which had, the, I thought, the best graphics for it, um, showing that as you went from the UK variant, the B117 variant, to the Delta, you are getting declines in protection against symptomatic illness. Israel seems to be more dramatic than than, than others, although we are hearing a lot of anecdotal reports now uh, in the United States. I think the bigger concern is, you know, is a lot of preprint information suggesting that the amount of virus of Delta in the nose and maybe other um, mucosal secretions from the nose and mouth and throat uh, might be quite a bit higher, as much as a thousand times higher based on the study in Guangdong. And then the question is, if you're asymptomatic, is is are the vaccines still halting asymptomatic illness? Because when, when the vaccines were first released through emergency use, we were all very excited about the high level of protection against symptomatic infection. But then studies out of Israel and the UK showed that yes, we we're also halting asymptomatic transmission or about 90% reduction. And I think the big question now is whether we're losing that second performance feature of the vaccine uh, because of the Delta variant and what do we do about it? And would doing a third immunization jack up virus neutralizing antibodies to restore that property? And what are the implications for, for global uh, equity given that the rest of the world uh, remains uh, unvaccinated? So these are some very difficult 
questions that we're all uh, grappling with uh, right now. And of course, in the United States, it's a particular problem because um, as good a job as we're doing in, in the Mid-Atlantic states and in the New England states and parts of the West Coast and New Mexico, um, the South is largely unvaccinated and we're paying the steep price for that now as the Delta variant accelerates through there as well, as well as some of the mountain uh, West states and most of these are conservative strongholds, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, but this is now I think creating a crisis and the president is trying to respond to this through federal mandates, but we still have the problem of how we're going to manage this um, through since so much vaccine policy in the United States is set at the at the state level and so we'll talk uh, a little bit more about that. And of course. This being IVAC, you have to address this horrific situation that we face where um, even despite our problems in parts of the United regions of the United States, where, where we have to come to the reality that so far we've pretty much only vaccinated the Northern Hemisphere, meaning, meaning the United States and Canada, Western Europe, the Nordic, Nordic countries, the UK, maybe a, a few other handful of places, Turkey, et cetera, but Africa remains largely unvaccinated, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, uh, large, pretty much unvaccinated Papua New Guinea, and then South America, profoundly underachieving. And how, how did we allow that situation to happen? I mean, the good news was people anticipated this, including a lot of people at IVAC. And I think the COVAX sharing facility, which I know Kate O'Brien has been, was heavily in, involved in, in generating was well thought out. I think there was, you know, a, a good plan in place for sharing vaccines. The problem ultimately came down to an upstream failure that there wasn't the vaccines avail made available. I think the problem was that we were so focused on innovation, mRNA vaccines and adenovirus vectored vaccines that maybe we didn't give enough attention to ensuring that in parallel, we had low cost durable vaccines to make for the world. And, and I know the Biden administration is looking to donate 200 million doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech this year, and maybe 50, 60 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine, doing some patent waivers. But my criticism has been fine, but it's not nearly enough. And, and what we've not really heard from the Biden administration, at least in my opinion, is a, is a frank discussion of the problem. And the problem is this at the bottom. You know, we've got more than a billion people in sub-Saharan Africa, 650 million people in Latin America, half a billion people in the smaller low-income countries of, of, a, of Southeast Asia, including Indonesia. That's two to three billion people. We need five to six billion doses of vaccine, and, and we need it now. And, and being self-congratulatory about donating 200 million doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is just not there. And I've been uh, I think the Biden administration has done everything humanly possible to vaccinate the United States, and I give them a lot of credit for that. But globally, they've just not come out with the statement, hey, we need to provide and take leadership in producing five to six billion doses of vaccine for the world. And the, the pushback I get is, well, why does it always have to be the United States? And I say, well, because when it comes to big things, it has to be the United States. That's just, just the reality. And and we're just not getting an, a frank discussion of this and, and what the Biden administration needs to do to vaccinate the world and not in 2023 or 2022. We need to do this now as Delta is accelerating and potentially causing a humanitarian uh, catastrophe. And, and so, you know, I think what happened was, you know, we, we made some good vaccines. Um, I'm, I'm myself I'm the beneficiary of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. I'm very grateful for that. Um, and, and the, 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 it was an impressive effort, both for the Moderna and Pfizer mRNA vaccines, as well as for um, some of the adenovirus vaccines. And we did, we made lots of really good, as I sometimes say in my frustration, which I know is a bit over the top, but just to make the point, I call them shiny new toys, but we need, we have to recognize that, you know, while with any new technology, there's a learning curve in terms of scaling it up. And we didn't put out enough matchbox cars um, to, to also assist in this. And, 
and some of the whole inactivated virus vaccines, which are matchbox cars, are actually more disappointing than I thought. I thought they would do a better job at inducing virus neutralizing antibodies and, and withstanding the variants so far, at least the two Chinese vaccines, sort of not, not the best. But I do think we could do a better job putting out protein subunit vaccines because we've been showing for 10 years that they can do very high levels of virus neutralizing antibody. And that's what we've done at, at our Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development, which is part of the National School of Tropical Medicine. We've been working with PATH, which I'm sure everybody at IVAC knows about, it used to be called the, the Program for Appropriate Technology for Health. And now we've licensed this, our, our vaccine to Biological E, which is one of the big vaccine producers in, in India, like the Serum Institute, but BioE is in Hyderabad as well as Biopharma in Indonesia and, and working on a couple of others, Immunity Bio, which is trying to work in South Africa to really scale up and produce our, our vaccine, which is now in phase three trials in India and the Indian government has done an advanced purchase of 300 million uh, doses. And um, uh, the, the Indians have given it a name called Corbivax and it's really an old school vaccine. It's the receptor binding domain of the spike two uh, sp uh, spike protein to the original lineage expressed in yeast Pickia pastoris, and then formulated on alum aluminum hydroxide together with a CPG oligonucleotide from the, the Dynavax uh, corporation. And now it's uh, going into uh, phase three and now it's being scaled up in Indonesia as well. The CPG motif seems to help quite a bit in terms of immune response. This is a toll-like 9 receptor, which is found in the endosomal vesicles of human B cells and plasmacytoid dendritic cells, and uh, also serves to balance out the immune response to give more, a more balanced Th2, uh, Th1 response. And, and now we have um, are moving pretty fast with this. We just published our non-human primate studies in collaboration with the Emory uh, Primate uh, Center and um, getting uh, really great reductions in the bronchoalveolar lavage amount of virus uh, with this adjuvant. In this particular study, we did the, our receptor binding domain with the 3M uh, adjuvant. Um, it look, looks really good and um, also no lung pathology as well and no immune enhancement either. And even um, in the throat swabs, for instance, we're getting you know one or two of the primates seems to have some some virus, but uh, most are are suppressed completely, and, and as well as the um, uh, nasal swabs as well. You know, we get one or two breakthrough that has some virus in their um, uh, uh, nose and throat, which is not too different from the mRNA vaccines or the the adenovirus vectored vaccines. And now this is uh, finished phase two clinical trials, and we're pretty excited by the T-cell responses and the virus neutralizing antibody. So what I'm showing you here is um, superimposed is where Corbivax, the, the, uh, our vaccine, lies in terms of virus neutralizing antibody based on a paper from uh, Nature Medicine where they did, looked at a ratio of neutralizing antibody titer in the vaccinees and then compared it to the convalescent plasma because if you only present the neutralizing antibody titer, there's so many different ways to do this, either with pseudovirus or PRNTs, and, and the, there's a lot of variability in technique. So by putting the virus neutralizing antibody in the, the, from the vaccine in the, the, numinator, numinator, the numerator in the, and the um, uh, convalescent antibody titer in the denominator, you get a ratio. And, and it's, not a tr it's by no means a true correlator protection, but it, you get a pretty rough idea of where you stand and with the mRNA vaccines having the highest levels of virus neutralizing the antibody and protective efficacy, less so the adenovirus vector vaccines. And then you get something like the Sinovac and activated virus vaccine. So we come out almost as good as the mRNA vaccines and, and better than a lot of the uh, adenovirus vector vaccines. And if that holds up, you know, we're really excited um, because we're getting good uh, um, cross protection versus the variants. Um, we're looking at Delta now, but so far we've got Alpha, Beta, and, and Kappa, which is the original Indian lineage to be 1617.1. So it's standing up uh, really well to that. And, um, and it's cheap. Um, so we think we can do this for $1.50 a dose, which is going to be one of the least expensive 
vaccines out there, there's no upper limit to the amount you could produce um, simple refrigeration. And it uses the same technology, meaning yeast expression used for the hepatitis B vaccine. And I say that because that vaccine has been used for kids and even infants for decades. And so if we have a technology using that, maybe it'll also be widely accepted as a, as a pediatric vaccine. And trying to have those conversations with the Biden administration to take ownership of this and say, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll work with a US producer and make you know, the billions of doses that BioE and BioPharma are, are unable to make. And, and, um, and we'll, we'll see where this goes in, in the coming, in the coming uh, weeks. Now, the other piece to this, as many of you know, is um, I've been actively involved in going up against anti-vaccine groups. And in this case, it was uh, mostly because I, in addition to being a vaccine scientist, I'm the parent of four adult uh, kids, including Rachel, who has autism and intellectual disabilities. And a few years ago, I wrote a book with a straightforward title uh, called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, which uh, put me in the crosshairs of the anti-vaccine groups and we've been engaged in that struggle uh, ever since. And thought I would, now I now clearly the anti-vaccine activities are headline news and could, thought I would tell you a little bit about how I think this has evolved from a very personal perspective going up against these guys for a long time. And, and while the US has this historical thread of anti-vaccine sentiment, I think in its modern form, it really began 23 years ago when uh, Wakefield and his colleagues at the Royal Free Hospital in London wrote this paper that turned out not to be valid, claiming that the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, especially the measles component, had the ability to replicate in the colon and somehow that led to autism and or what they then called pervasive developmental disorder. And it turned out not to be true, of course, and, and the paper was retracted and a lot of the investigative work on that was led by Brian Deere, um, who was a journalist for the Times of London and worked for the British Medical Journal, who also now has a new book about this um, published by Johns Hopkins University Press, the whole, the whole Wakefield story. And, but the problem was by not retracting it for 12 years, it, it gave a lot of momentum to an anti-vaccine movement so that by 2019, even before the pandemic, this had become a huge problem in Europe um, where we had the return of measles, 80,000 measles cases in 2018, 90,000 measles cases in 2019, so much so that the World Health Organization cited, uh, COVID, uh, cited vaccine hesitancy as one of the top 10 global health threats. And I, I think people like Heidi Larson at the, at, the, at the Vaccine Confidence Center at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine did a lot of important work here to, to really emphasize this global importance of what people call vaccine hesitancy, vaccine resistance. But in parallel, it had been taking off in the United States and thought I would tell briefly that story because it, it, makes, it provides people a framework to understand what's actually going on with the anti-vaccine movement here. And it began in version 1.0 in, in the US through these fake links between vaccines and autism. But then it didn't stop there. While the vaccine and autism thread never went away, it took on this political dimension um, under this banner of health freedom, medical freedom. And now we're dealing with what I call the empire, the globalization of what started uh, in the United States. So let me take you through version 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 very quickly. So version 1.0 was the claim that, that, that the MMR vaccine caused autism. And there was a lot of work done, including work at Hopkins, uh, showing that kids who got the MMR vaccine, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, were no more likely to um, be on the autism spectrum than kids who didn't get the MMR vaccine. And similarly, kids on the autism spectrum were no more likely to have gotten the MMR vaccine than kids not on the autism spectrum. And that was hard work. And and, but it was, I think, effectively diffused that link. But we started getting into the situation where the anti-vaccine groups would keep on moving the goalpost. Okay, you don't think it's MMR, it must be thimerosal preservative in vaccine. And then again, the scientific community would respond with very strong studies showing no link. And, but then it would move again to spacing of vaccines or alum in vaccines. And then they began even branching out 
uh, to away from autism, saying that uh, the real problems with the HPV vaccine for the papillomavirus vaccine for cervical cancer and other cancers, claiming that, that it causes infertility and autoimmunity. And by the way, if that sounds familiar with the COVID-19 vaccine assertions, the fake assertions, that's because that's exactly what anti-vaccine groups do. If they get any traction, they'll copy paste it onto new vaccines like they do COVID-19 vaccines. And then it moved towards uh, cro chronic illness. And this is when I really became involved as a um, I'm more involved as a vaccine advocate writing the book, Vaccines Did Not Cause, uh, Re vaccines did not cause Rachel's Autism, which goes into detail about that. It's a very, and it's in addition to the science showing that there's no link between vaccines and autism, telling a very personal story with a lot of help from Johns Hopkins Press, who gave me that courage to really tell that personal story about um, uh, me with, with my wife, Anne. That's us in the lower right. If, if you recognize the iconic picture, that's what it actually looks like. It's a, it's a corner in my, in my bedroom with a laptop propped up on a box of seltzer with a bunch of papers underneath it, very high tech uh, office. And, and then telling the story about Rachel and, and that's me with Rachel at uh, Velvet Taco on Westheimer Street in Houston, who has uh, autism and intellectual disabilities and going into detail with explaining all of that data. And, and this was tough because the anti-vaccine groups found this is a real threat. This is when um, the, they started calling me the OG villain, which I had to look up. It means the original gangster villain. So we're, you have the original gangster villain speaking to you today. And then we go into detail explaining, you know, I'm not giving an alternative narrative of what autism is. And I talked about doing whole exome sequencing on my wife and I and Rachel and looking at the exon sequences that encode the proteins. And we found uh, an autism gene uh, uh, in, in Rachel. And similar to uh, the hundred or so genes that have been identified by the Broad Institute at Harvard MIT in there, all expressed in early fetal brain development, which makes sense, all but one expressed in the cortex. Most are expressed and enriched in early in, in excitatory inhibitory neuronal lineages. They regulate synapses, and, and a lot of them are neuronal cytoskeleton genes. And indeed, the one from Rachel is a neuronal spectrin, uh, which hadn't been described before, but the technology is so advanced, but you can go through databases and the group at Baylor Genetics was able to find a couple of others. And now there's a fly model, a mouse model. And uh, in the bottom right, this was just published uh, this year in, um, in the American Journal of Medical Genetics, Rachel Sheen and, and, and others. And so the point is we do understand more and more the neurobiological basis of autism and, and that story needs to be told. And, and, and I think that had some effect. I did think it had some effect in taking some of the wind out of the sails of the anti-vaccine groups uh, that claimed vaccines cause autism. But then it took a political dimension, which I didn't anticipate. And it really started around 2014, 2015. And you know, people like Dan Salmon and, and, and Saad Omer were really you know, on top of this. And they saw that as the number of uh, um, um, parents started opting their kids out of getting vaccinated vaccinations because of fears of autism, we had reached a point, inflection point, where we were at risk of measles epidemics because of the high reproductive number of, of measles. And that, in fact, started to happen in 2014, 2015 in Orange County, California, uh, causing the state legislature to shut down, state legislature to shut down medical exemptions and this, which was a hard fought battle, and but this then uh, led to version 2.0 under this banner of health freedom, medical freedom. People were charged up to say, hey, you can't, the government can't tell us what to do about our kids. And, and even though it started in Orange County, it really accelerated here. And this is a graph put out from Reka Lakshman and at the, at, the, um, at the immunization partnership here in Texas, which does a lot of vaccine advocacy and policy working with the Texas legislature. So we were up to 70,000 kids not being vaccinated. And this didn't accommodate, account for any of the 300,000 homeschooled kids. And it was really terrible in some of the suburbs of Austin, which became a center, and up in North Texas, which became a center for the anti-vaccine movement. And uh, again, very much linked to the political Tea Party on the right. And this, this was tough for me to talk about because 
as vaccine scientists or a science, physician scientist, you know, you're not supposed to talk about Republicans and Democrats or liberals and conservatives. That's, um, we're supposed to be above all that, but, you know, this was so clearly aligned to a political group and the formation of a political action committee. For me, it was a struggle because I didn't know how to talk about it other than to talk about it and, and call it out with the hope that it'd be understood that our, it's not me is politicizing the vaccines, it's the bad guys. And it's up to us as scientists and humanitarians to try to yank the anti-science out of the politics and put a shine a light on it. And it really accelerated, uh, you know, in the, in 2020, um, in part under President Trump, but here in Texas, for instance, those same anti-vaccine groups, including Texans for Vaccine Choice, were rallying against social distancing and masks and contact tracing. So it became kind of a an anti-science movement and even uh, targeting scientists. So I have a paper out in Public Library Science Plus Biology today talks about how this added dimension now about how people on the extreme right are actually targeting individual scientists and the implication that has for, for American science. And, and clearly it's played out as a partisan divide um, along COVID-19 vaccines, where people like Charles Gabba and others clearly show that the highest vaccination rates are in the blue states and the lowest are in the red states. And, and the redder the red, the lower the vaccination rate. So we've got this very, that's why we have this very dangerous situation on Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi. And here in the South, schools open early. Um, you know, I think in Louisiana, some of the parishes open August 9th, just as uh, Delta is accelerating. And we, you know, if you look at some of the numbers, only 17% of the adolescents are vaccinated, 15% of the adolescents are vaccinated, maybe 30, 40% of the young adults. Delta is accelerating, and a lot of the red state governors are not allowing any mask mandates. So, you know, like I say, toss me a bone here, give me something to work with, but I, I don't see how this is going to go well as we move uh, into the summer. So I would imagine we'll see a surge um, this summer, much like across the South last summer, not as many deaths among older Americans, but we're going to see a lot of young people with Delta uh, pile into hospitals and, and then the long haul COVID uh, aspects. And then we have now this globalization. So this is also relatively new. So starting in 2020, we had um, the, the US style anti-mask, anti-vaccine rallies in, in London and Paris and Berlin and New York Times and BBC reported that it was linked even to QAnon and political extremist groups uh, on the far right. So this has taken on a very dark turn. And of course, that's not complicated enough. So now we have some good reporting from US and British intelligence that um, the Russian government has been piling on and using anti-vaccine, anti-science messaging as a wedge issue to destabilize our country. And um, it's even been given a name of weaponized health communication coming from the Russian government. So now we've got not only the political right and the Russian government, but um, as you know, the, many of you know now, the Center for Countering Digital Hate, it's amazing you have to have an organization called the Center for Countering Digital Hate, which is led by Imran Ahmed, who's done a really good job of identifying who the, the, the major non-governmental groups involved in putting out anti-vaccine messages. And they've identified a dozen that they call the disinformation dozen responsible for about 65% of the, of the content. I looked at the list. I have no problem with the list. There are probably a few others I might add on, but you get the idea. Now it's we've got these three elements. We've got the the far right, the non-governmental groups, and then the Russian government. And um, this is this is having a huge impact. And and it's it's a killer. And I've written papers with the very provocative title of anti-science kills. And to say that this is an anti-science movement that's that's global and and I point out that, look, when you look at the 614,000 Americans who've lost their lives and we're getting up to 640,000 uh, at some point this year, and that, that's the number of Americans who lost their lives uh, in the 1918 to 1921 flu pandemic. So we're getting to those kinds of numbers that, um, yes, the SARS-2 coronavirus was the lead reason, but it was enabled by defiance, defiance against masks and social distancing and contact tracing. And I make the point 
that anti-science is as much of a killer as the kinds of things that we build infrastructure for, things like nuclear proliferation or global terrorism or cyber attacks. But for some reason, we're reluctant to build an infrastructure to, to counter this. So we, we're very focused on amplifying our message, but I don't think that's adequate. I think we're gonna need a more aggressive approach. And, and I've tried to describe this. This is a piece I wrote in the Daily Beast, which has some great graphics if you're interested. And it calls out the triple headed monster of the US based NGOs that were identified by the Center for Countering Digital Hate the far right wing extremism, the political action committees are now becoming mainstream across the GOP tragically, and then the state actors led by the Russian government under Putin. So I'll stop there. This is uh, an essay I've written recently in Nature that basically makes the argument, we have to use some new tools to fight this. And I think part of the problem is the, the US agencies and the health sectors have just not I don't know that, that they have the knowledge base and skills to know how to fight this. And I've said, and it's not a criticism, it says just a reality that we have to bring in people from outside the health sector, from Homeland Security, from the Commerce Department, from Justice Department, State Department, that know how to go up against bad guys that are, that are perpetrating terrorism and nuclear proliferation and, and cyber attacks, because I think anti-science has reached that dimension now. So um, that's, that's the overview and I'd be curious to hear, think what, listen to what other people have to say and, and get your thoughts. Thank you so much, Peter. Very broad ranging and insightful. Um, it was a pleasure to listen to. Um, Thank you. I might um, take the opportunity to jump in and ask the first question, if, if I may. I, I, I wanted to, um, you mentioned sort of countering um, this counterculture or countering anti-science and I'd rather let, for a moment turn our sights inwards and say what are the risks of the way in which we respond and, and I, I mean to kind of invoke um, the idea of scepticism. Scepticism is part and parcel of the scientific method where we scientists are skeptics and so if there's anybody who's a vaccine skeptic it's us in the sense that we really want to rely on evidence to demonstrate um, benefit and so on. Is there a risk that in countering uh, public scepticism around vaccines that we will perhaps uh, limit the nuance of the discussion, limit the role for argumentation around pros and cons? And, and is there a risk that we underdo what we always have done so well as scientists, which is to think skeptically? Yeah, I have no problem in thinking skeptically, and I, I do it all the time in our lab meetings, and that's, that's our job, right, as, as scientists. I think, though, it's, it's going after the groups that are doing this with nefarious intent, um, and they're doing it um, in order to create an authoritarian regime or destabilize our democracy uh, or monetize the internet um, through selling fake products, autism cure, fake autism cures and nutritional supplements or fake books on, on Amazon or monetizing the internet. And, and those are the groups that I'm talking about. And, and that's why I'm very you know, reluctant to, or, or I usually don't blame um, parents or people who are hesitant about getting a COVID vaccine. They're the victims. They're the victims of this deliberate disinformation empire. And and that's what we have to tackle. And that that's what's that's what's so dangerous. And you're right. It's we don't have a lot of big roadmap to go on here, right? This is uh, this is uh, this is uncharted territory. And that's why I say we have to get some advice from people outside the health sector that have been dealing with bad bad guys for a long, long time, and and have a better sense of how far you can push this without you know interfering with first amendment rights or 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 um uh, or doing untoward or do, making things worse in the process one of the other things that's um, that we do well as scientists is think slowly and think critically and, and i we've been challenged i think by the speed at which the pandemic has challenged our notions of, of what's happening and the the speed at which science is emerging versus the rigor of that science and you know everybody's referring to preprints that are not yet peer reviewed and that's now become the norm and so on um, and policies being made on the basis of headlines and press releases even before uh, 
thorough uh, gathering of information. How, how do we deal with that? How do we make good policy yeah, well, on the well, basis I think, of this? Event? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think it's it's brought out the best and the worst. So the best be, means that, you know, in the scientific community, I mean, I'm on, like everybody who's watching this, I'm on Zoom calls all the time, right, with other scientists trying to figure this out, looking at bioarchive, med archive, and the sharing and the collegiality, you know, is like nothing I've ever seen before. We're all scared of this pandemic and we all want to do it right. So, you know, and and I'm on Zoom calls if for no other purpose, just to compare notes and make certain that I'm not going off on, especially because I'm talking about on CNN and MSNBC, I want to make certain I'm not going off on some wackadoodle tangent. So, for instance, I do a, a weekly call when possible with people like Mike Osterholm or Stephen Hahn or um, you know Peggy Hamburg, really smart, Penny Heaton, really smart people to help guide me through this so we don't go off too much on a tangent. So I think it's people are really working hard to thread that needle of um, being responsible and yet not being so deliberate that you don't say anything, which is which is equally bad. So we don't always get it right, but I think I think overall that that's gone well. I think the, a lot of the problem has been the the pharma company press releases. I think have been consistently disruptive, and and as I like to say, you know, with the with the when the farm with the CEO of a of a pharma company sends out a press release, it's not meant for you or for me. It's meant for their shareholders, and it's meant to spectacularize their accomplishments so it jacks up the stock price. That's the reason why you do the press releases. And, and that's always worked for pharma companies. The problem is, you know, in, in this, um, these unprecedented times, it's tone deaf to the public health impact. So we just saw this with the third dose of the mRNA vaccine for the Pfizer BioNTech. Well, maybe there's merit to it, but there's no data or information in that press release to warrant it. And it freaks people out and then we have to backtrack. But in, in the end, it may turn out to be the right the right thing to do. Um, the tough one was the for me, the most damaging ones were the one that, you know, said the mRNA vaccines were, you know, mixed up in a couple of days. And now we voila, we've got a miracle vaccine. And tone deaf again to the fact that, well, how can we trust her, these vaccines? And again, I had a number of us had to do damage control, say, hold on, this this was not a quick process. This built on a decade of research and development, maybe two decades of research development since the scientific community began working on SARS vaccines after the epidemic in 2002, 2003. And, and so, so that, that has not always gone well. And then doing it in the context of this anti-science, anti-vaccine aggression, where um, you know any weakness is exploited and pounced upon. And, and before we know it, we're we're not making vaccines. We're making genetic modifications. We're, um, you know, we're putting in microchips. Or you got Peter Hotez and Bill Gates putting in microchips, and we're doing special labs in Area 51. And you know, it's so it's it's and then and then the far right aggression, which has been really tough. And you know, it's not fun getting waking up at the email saying an army of patriots is going to hunt me down. And I'm like saying, well, why do you need an army of patriots? It's just me and Anne and Rachel and the cat now. I mean, the other older kids are out of the house. I would think one patriot's enough or maybe two patriots, but you don't need a whole army of patriots. And, you know, you just have yeah. to laugh because it's just so awful, you know, out there right sure. now. Yeah. Sure. Um, Laura Schimp makes the point and asks the question in the Q&A where we, you put up the slides showing the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines globally. And I think we're all very aware <laughs> Uh, not only of the justice questions are, that that raises that are very serious indeed, but also just pragmatic questions around emergence of, uh, of variants and allowing that to occur and so on by, by leaving large parts of the world unvaccinated. But more than just vaccine procurement, Laura's point makes, uh, the, the, raises the question around delivery and communicating and communication uh, and whether there's enough being done on that, whether there's enough funding on that, and what are the perhaps novel approaches to delivering vaccines and to communicating about vaccines and concerns in low middle income countries, particularly in the context of increasing hesitancy around the world. Yeah, well, no one's thought more about vaccine delivery and resource poor settings than IVAC, right? So this is where we 
really need your expertise and the same problems we're going to have we've had for decades are, are going to be amplified with COVID-19 and now you've got the anti-vaccine anti-science aggression which has become global as, as some of us predicted and particularly in Africa right now and now we've got reports uh, from Novatella and analytics groups saying that now Putin is specifically working to discredit Western COVID-19 vaccines in Africa in order to prop up Sputnik V. And, and that's yet another problem. And, and this informal, you know, everyone has an iPhone now, right? Or, a, or, or, or access to a cell phone. And so all of these anti-vaccine messages are traveling all over Africa. And it doesn't help that one of the groups uh, identified by the Center for Countering Digital Hate has put out this fake documentary, right? That that shows people getting the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine and switches to images, grainy images from the 50s and 60s of Tuskegee experimentation and works to equate the two. And and so this is the damage of of the disinformation. It makes a it makes a hard job next to impossible. We've got um, questions in the chat also addressing the uh, question of global equ equity and asking what can ordinary people do? Uh, what, can, what kind of pressure can be brought on politicians? How can we engage with politicians, some of whom themselves may be uh, somewhat anti-vaccine uh, in their own personal views? What strategies are there to engage with decision makers, whether here at home or abroad, uh, to really improve access globally? I think, you know, what would really help is, you know, some some going back to basics a bit and and just articulating the problem and, and convincing everyone that the, the problem is understood that we have to get five to six billion doses out there now and 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 provide a direct roadmap and an Excel spreadsheet to say, OK, this is what we have in hand right now for the inventory for this, that. Here's what we're missing. Here's what we need to do. And, and I just haven't seen that, um, on at least, you know, you know, maybe it's there somewhere, but at least not publicly disclosed. And even that alone would be helpful so people understand what we're, what we're up against. And of course, global health, even in good times, is a tough sell in the United States, although we've got some, you know, fantastic groups like, you know, the, you know, the, the UN Foundation, the Shot at Life people and the and the, you know the Global Health Technologies Coalition and Global Health Council to keep this on the radar screen, and and that's really tough. But I think trying to get the Biden administration to give a, a more frank accounting, I think, is going to be really important. I'd like to ask you a question that perhaps is not answerable, but um, let's uh, let's challenge you anyway. Uh, it requires kind of the wisdom of a Buddha or a Solomon or something. But let's imagine that the science demonstrates that we really do need a third dose in order to retain immunogenicity or to retain protection against Delta. And we're in a position now where many of the Western countries have received two doses. And there's an argument being made for a third dose, despite the fact that many low and middle income countries haven't yet received even the first dose. What should we do in that situation? There is an imperil, imperative need to give that third dose, and yet it would be unjust to give it to those who've received two and not give the one to those who've received none. How would you tackle that issue? Well, again, I think you know the, the, the equity argument is very focused on donating doses in hand. And I get that and I get the importance, but remember, even if the US were to unload its entire stockpile it's still not even going to come close to addressing the issue. So um, the way I think of it is not either or. Yes, we should continue to donate doses, but recognizing that donation that that the tech that the technology is not sufficiently advanced to vaccinate the world. And so my argument, with with an obvious conflict of interest disclosed, is that let's let's start scaling up what we can um, to make a vaccine that's safe and, and works. As, as we get better in learning how to scale up the mRNA technology, and it, it will get better, right? I mean, we know, I mean, this has moved incredibly quickly, right? Um, and, and we will get better at scaling it up and we'll figure it out eventually, probably how to do it without even a cold chain. And so five years from now, I think we'll be in a much better position, but, but not now. And, and I think that's another message for 
the world as well and moving forward in terms of building capacity, um, how we keep all of these technologies in play. Now what you're starting to hear also is, you know, we tend, the, the global health space tend to be, tends to be like a little kid's soccer game. The ball goes off in one direction and all the little kids run after it and nobody plays behind. And now everyone's talking about where well, you have to scale up mRNA vaccines for future pandemics. It may not work for the next one. And, you know, for instance, when, when COVID-19 hit, um, and if you asked me what was going to be the best vaccine that will really work for the world, and you said, Ixnay, Peter, I'm saying your vaccine, I would have said the Merck VSV vaccine, the vesicular stomatitis vaccine. I mean, that's still one of the most extraordinary um, public health stories that really hasn't been told, how, you know, that, that VZV Ebola vaccine basically vaccinated the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo and, and stabilized the African continent. I said, wow, that's an, you know, in high percent protection, same kind of thing, 90, 95% protection. Inside I said, the probably, world, right? that, probably that's going to be the one for COVID-19. And mRNA vaccines, well, come on, we've been talking about DNA and RNA vaccines for how many decades, and it hasn't panned out. So yeah, VSV is going to be the one. Of course, it tanked, right? And mRNA was spectacularly, spectacularly successful, at least for the northern, making enough for the northern hemisphere. But I think the lesson learned is we have to, we, know, we don't know what's going to be the best one. And we have to keep multiple technologies in play and think about creating those CMC hub, you know, chemical manufacturing control hubs all around the world, and also becoming less dependent on the multinational pharmaceutical companies. I mean, they have done, you know, in the history of global health the last 20 years, they've made extraordinary contributions to, um, to, uh, to Ga the Gavi Alliance, we couldn't do this without them. But on the other hand, we can't be completely dependent on them. We've got to build capacity for vaccine production at scale. Right now, no vaccines are made on the African continent. South America profoundly underachieves, you know, some in Brazil and Cuba, but underachieved. Southeast Asia underachieved. So building that capacity, I think, is going to be one of our, our big challenges once, you know, post-apocalypse, once we get through this. Yeah, well, there's a lot still to do. So thank you so much uh, for joining us today. It's been a fantastic uh, discussion. And I also would like to thank the audience members for posting really thoughtful questions. I recognize that we didn't get through them all, um, but hopefully there'll be a, maybe a, a second round as we go forward uh, and we'll hopefully get the opportunity to see you again, Peter, with us.